Well, power shot tet save. I have a biased interest in this parsha. Rukashim. Some of you probably know this already. May, many, some of you may not. Um, that everyone has a Torah portion associated with their birthday, right? So uh, Ezra and Nehemiah were the first ones to start creating the Parashot system because when they came back from Babylon, they all figured out right away the reason we went to Babylon is because we weren't studying the Torah, right? We weren't not just studying it, but living it out, right? And so when they got back, they said, we're going to try to rectify that problem and we're going to create a system by which everyone is studying the Torah on a, on a weekly basis, if not daily. Eventually that became the weekly parashot, which means portions, parasha, singular. And so uh, as we know, the word of God, the Torah, particularly all of it, um, inclusively, but, but the Torah particularly is divine and not just, not just the words, but the very letters of the Torah are divine. And Hebrew is the divine language. The, the Bible has been translated into probably every language, I would imagine, or at least most languages. But the, the language that stands out as the only true Lashana Kodesh is the holy tongue of Hebrew, Ivrit. So you can find out, you can go back in time. Some of us have to travel further back than others. Uh, but you can go back in time and find out what your portion is. And uh, I want to tell you that, that often, very often, it, you know, most of the time when people study their birth portion, they find incredible things about their personality, their life. Just, it's, it's you know, things that minister to them. It's really incredible. Now... Chabad has made it easy. They have an app on their, I guess you call it an app, whatever. On the, online, you can go to My Hebrew Birthday and, uh, with Chabad's website, and you can just type in your birthday, and it'll, boom, pull up um, whatever your Torah portion is for that time. And so mine happens to be Tetzave. What's, um, so when I, went, when I found that out so many years ago, went back and looked, just to give you an example, this is how it works. Now, this is kind of crazy, strange, not strange, but, you know, amazing. So, um, my, my given name is Mark Aaron. So, I choose, um, Mordecai is a direct translation of Mark. It's the Hebrew of Mark. Uh, Mordecai. So, you would say that <laughs> properly, and that's what I used to, when I was, I used to be a martial art instructor, and that's what I used to do. Mordecai. You know, that's how I used to do it. So, uh, anyway. So, uh, it just so happens that um, the Aaron part was just my parents deciding that that sounded good with the first name. So, uh, my, the, but the tour portion, my tour portion is all about the garments of Aaron. And it is uh, right, right before, the, the, or right around anyway, I think it's normally right before the festival of Purim. I was born on the Hebrew calendar 10 days before the festival of Purim. I was born on the 4th of Adar. And Hashem destined that one day I would marry a woman named Shoshana. Nice. And the root of Shoshana, Shushan and Shoshana have the same root. And then he ordained that one day I'd have this little girl named Hadassah. No. Oh. <laughs> so uh, we're like a Purim family. Nice. Yeah. And so all I need is dice hanging from my window and I'll be like, Get, get it? The dice hanging? All right. Lots hanging from the... Anyway. So I encourage you to look up your tour portion. It's, it's amazing what you will find. Uh, that's where many people who do not have a Hebrew name per se, and they're, when they go through conversion, they'll study their, their birth portion, and off, very often they will find something in there that will speak to them, Hashem will speak to them, and they will choose a name from that portion. Many people have done that here at Sar Shalom. Um, and it's pretty amazing. So once, once I learn your Hebrew name, I, often I forget your given name. And uh, people say, do you know so-and-so? I'm like, oh, no, I don't. Who is that person? Oh, yeah. That's Hillel or whatever. Yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> because the old person dies, the new person, the new creation lives, you know, all that kind of stuff. Let's pray and ask the Ruach HaKodesh to uh, speak to us today as we open up Parashat Tetzave. 
Hashem, thank you, Father, for your word, and thank you for your divine presence in our life. You care for us so much that you orchestrate when we're born, and you coordinate what parashot, or parashah rather, we should be born under. Hashem, thank you, because your love for us, your care for us, goes to the very essence of our being. So today, Adonai, we sit down at the table of Torah, and we accept the, fest of the feast that you've given us. We ask you to nourish our bodies, our soul, our spirit with it today. Open up our eyes that we may, can behold beautiful things in your Torah. And most of all, Hashem, transform us into your image as we study your holy word in the merit of Yeshua. Amen. Well, this is, uh, again, an, an amazing Torah portion. Um, is we just read uh, so many wonderful things. So many things could be brought forth from the Haftarah, which is one of my favorite stories about King Saul losing his kingship. Not because he lost his kingship. We, we, we are saddened by that, and, Sa and Samuel himself was saddened by that. But it's a lesson to us to learn why he lost his kingship. And I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. Why today... What is the only, the only reason today that we do not cry out, Messiah, son of Saul? There's only one reason. There's only one reason that we don't say that. Because we could have, we, sh we perhaps should have been crying out, Messiah, Messiah, son of Saul, save us. Why do we not do that? And the answer is, is because Saul did not follow the word of God. And as a result, he lost his kingship and in effect lost the, the right to the eternal throne. All because he chose not to obey a commandment. And notice what Saul did. He told Samuel, I followed God's command. Because in his mind, he had adjusted the commandment to fit his situation. Which is what a lot of people do. And a lot of people do that in theology, right? I want to believe something. This is what I want to believe. And, and so I've got that. I, I get it down pat. This is what I believe. A, B, C, D. Yep, sounds good. I write it out myself. Uh, there it is. Now, let me go to the Bible and justify that. Right? And that's what Saul did. Now, see, but the commandment of God didn't work out because my people were freaking out and they were stealing the sheep and wanting to do all this kind of, kind of stuff. So I, I interpreted what God meant. And, it, and by the way, my interpretation just so happens works out for my situation. And therefore, I follow that situation and then, I, then it doesn't matter what God said. But that's not how we're supposed to follow. That's not, not, not how we're supposed to work our theology, so to speak. Our theolo theology is supposed to be that... We go to the Word of God, and we find out what God wants us to do, and we mold our life to that. Now, that's very uncomfortable for most people, and it's very challenging for a lot of people. I, I, for instance, uh, uh, you know, uh, some people, um, I don't know, I, I, I read about the wearing of seat seat this week. It had to do with the garments. Um, it was very interesting thing, because I've heard people over the years, you know, wearing, about wearing tzitzit, that, um, that's the tassels that we wear, as men, that men wear, and, and people said, I don't know if I'd want to walk around with that, and, you know, and I love how people say, you know, it's, and it's so hot, you know, you've got this, this fabric that, uh, this, this tzitzit garment, so you can get one in mesh, by the way, which I wear in Jamaica, <laughs> Yaman. Eam wear it there. Um, but but the, other, the other one, you can get cotton. It's like, it's like, it's like cheesecloth, you know? But it'd be like, that's so hot. You know, really? But anyway, that's not really the reason. But here's why people struggle. Let me, let me tell you why people really struggle sometimes doing such a simple mitzvah like wearing tzitzit. In one, the, there, was a, there was a video that went around for a while there was a young boy, 15 I believe he was, in Israel who had a, a death experience, you know, and, and a, it was interesting to me, he had lots of things to say, but one of the things he said that I thought was just interesting was that how big of a mitzvah it was for men to wear tzitzit, and how much, how much applause, so to speak, in heaven he got for, for that, for fulfilling that mitzvah, right? 
And, how, and, and he, he was saying that before he did not wear, before this experience, he did not wear a seat seat, but now he like wears them all the time. And how, what a big misfit was. So it was always curious to me what, why that's such a big misfit. Because a lot of times, as humans, we like to figure out which, which misfits are important to God, which ones aren't. And then we, we pick the ones that are important, and we don't ever think to ask him. Right? Right? And husbands, how does that work at home when you figure out what's important to my wife and what's not, and then I just make it up on my own, and then I get frustrated when it's not important to her. Right? Don't raise your hand. So anyway, it's important to God. So what the, what the sages said about in the Talmud about tzitzit was is that tzitzit are a badge of servitude. A badge of servitude. A badge of servanthood. So, so why is it that our flesh really ultimately, why is it that I don't want to wear the tzitzit? Is it because they're too hot? Is it because we're embarrassed? Is it because it's out of the norm? No, no. It's, it's a, it runs against our spirit because by wearing them, we're saying we belong to somebody. And the fact of the matter is, our flesh does not want to obey anything other than our own will, even if it's God's holy word. That's why we ultimately don't want to follow commands. That was Saul's problem. We ultimately don't want to follow the commandments because it's God's word. We, and the, the thing is, we want to follow our word. And even as believers, we struggle with that sometimes. We can be, we can be shown in black and white. We can have all this, the written scripture proof. We can have proof from history. We can have proof from Bible culture. We can have proof from all the rabbinical sources that this is what, this is what was done. And this is how it was done. And yet we want to make it up on our own. Why? Because we like to be the center of our own universe. That's harsh. I want y'all to come back. <laughs> By the way, this is an aside. I haven't even got to the message yet, but this is an aside on critical thinking. How important is critical thinking, right? And deductive reasoning and those types of things. Logic, it's all important. Being smart is not because you got all A's in school. I mean, that's important. It's important. Um, <laughs> but it goes beyond that, right? <laughs> uh, hallelujah. It goes beyond that. So someone recently put something out there in the stratosphere, and, was, and, I, and I, did, I was just reflecting on the comment. They're from the, uh, the Two House Hebrew Roots Movement. Some of you know what that is, and if you don't, don't look into it. It's not worth your time. If, if what I'm telling you, you're like, I have totally clue this. Good. Okay? Let's move on. But anyway, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, this will mean something. And those of you who are watching, I hope it means something to you too. So this person was saying, he's a lead, big leader in that movement, was saying that, listen, we, all we want is equity. We want, um, he's talking about the Messianic world, because in the Messianic world, pretty much, they say this isn't the case, but it is. If you're Jewish, you're like in the top of the food chain, and if you're not Jewish by birth, you're a second-class citizen. That's just the bottom line, okay? And there's even so much, it goes even so far sometimes that in Messianic synagogues, if you're not Jewish, they'll like kind of screen you at the door. If you're not Jewish, then you really shouldn't go here, you know? So this person was saying that we as non-Jews, Gentiles, Messianic Gentiles, I guess you would say it. Maybe they don't call themselves that. But in any case, we want equity. We want, we want to be on the same playing field. So if we embrace Torah, don't look down upon us. And don't think we're, we shouldn't embrace Torah and, all, and Torah is not for us and all those kind of things, right? So I'm reflecting on this and going, okay, yeah, make, I can see that. You want, you want equity. But then I get to thinking to myself, wait a minute. If, you think you, if you're Jewish by birth or by heritage and you look down on somebody who's not Jewish by heritage and you say the Torah is not for you, that's bigotry. Right, right. Okay? Right? You're being bigoted at that moment. Especially since the ultimate sin of bigotry is you couldn't help how you were born. Right? I didn't choose to be this color. I didn't choose to be born in this state. Although I'm glad I did. <laughs> I didn't choose to be born whatever. But anyway, we don't have no control over that, Right? It's all God. He chooses. So therefore, we shouldn't look down on anybody because, like, we did something to achieve this. <laughs> so so that, that's bigotry, right? But wait a minute. Over here in this camp, you want to be equal. Everybody's on the same level playing field. Everybody can keep Torah and nobody's looking down on each other, but you still want to be separate. You want to be two houses. You want to be the house of Judah and the house of Ephraim. You want to be Jew and you want to be Gentile. 
that's called segregation. Bigotry is at the root of segregation, and it's at the root of looking down on somebody. So you still have the problem of separate but equal, or we're, we're just better. But it's both bigotry. Just think about that. Let that simmer. Um, you know, that's because we're still not solving the problem, right? And God did never say God was not into segregation, and He was not into bigotry, or both. That's not the answer. The answer is integration. The answer is family. And 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 family happens all kinds of ways. You're born into a family, you're adopted into a family. It doesn't matter. You're still family, right? Come on. All right, so twice a fall from grace from Parasha, uh, Parasha Tetzave. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back. We're going to begin by looking at the Midrash Rabbah from Parasha Mishpatim, which happens to be my wife's portion. Uh, so I thought it only appropriate for me to go back to her portion as I'm studying my portion. No. So Parasha Mishpatim, Midrash Rabbah 32.1. This is what it says. Behold, I send an angel before you to protect you on the way and to bring you to a place that I have made ready. That's from Shemot 2320. Okay? Behold, I send an angel before you. The Midrash breaks this down and says, Thus it is written, I said, you are angelic. Psalms 82.9. And my wife is. That's, okay, enough of that. You are angelic. This means that if the people of Israel had waited for Moses to return from Mount Sinai and not perform, say not, not, not perform that deed of worshiping the golden calf, neither a foreign king nor the angel of death would have prevailed over them. In other words, pr prior to the dancing around the golden calf, prior to that, the angel of death had been eradicated from the people of Israel. And they had been made like angels. We had been made. Remember, we're supposed to see ourselves as if we were there. We had been made. And thus does it say, or state rather, and the script was the script of God, Cherut, on the tablets. What is meant by the word Cherut? Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Nakmaya give different interpretations. Rabbi Yehuda says it is Cherut, Freedom, in verses Charut, it's freedom from the subjugation of foreign kings. Rabbi Nechmaya says that it means freedom from the angel of death. In other words, no one will rule over us, not man or demons, so to speak, or death, only God, because what we have is freedom on the tablets. Now, this is important if, if, if you're watching or if you're in the room today and you come from a Christian background, you have been taught that the, 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 the Torah is bondage and that the Jewish people are sitting around waiting for Messiah to show up to deliver them from the chains of Torah, right? So what I want you to know is that's complete, as my daughter would say, rubbish. Okay? Uh, that's complete rubbish. Jude Jews and Judaism have never, ever, ever taught that the Torah is bondage. The Bible does not teach that. It teaches the exact opposite. The exact opposite, okay? So that is from the MSU Academy, making stuff up. All right, so it says, Rabbi Nachmanias explains why Israel was granted immortality. For when the people of Israel said, everything that Hashem has said, we will do and we will obey, the Holy One blessed be, he says, I commanded Adam the first man only one commandment so that he should fulfill it. And immediately I made him equal to the ministering angels. As it is said, behold, man was like one among us, Genesis 3.22. If so, these people of Israel who perform and fulfill all 613 of the commandments Besides the generalizations and specifications of the finer details, is it not logically compelling that I should cause them to live and endure forever? And so it says, and from the gift, Nakaliel, Numbers 21, 19. 
meaning that they inherited from the Holy One, blessed be He, the right to live and endure forever. Now, do you understand what's going on here? At Mount Sinai, before the golden calf, Israel was destined to live on for, for eternity, just like Adam, who was like the first temple. Okay? However, once they said, with regard to the golden calf, this is your God, O Israel. Death came upon them once more. Say once more. Once more. So, Adam, who was the first man and also the first Jew, really, born circumcised and so on, was likened to the first temple. And he, because when the temple existed, there was righteousness on the earth and everybody was happy. But then the, the temple fell, and so he fell and brought death. Then the children of Israel came to Mount Sinai, and they were like the second temple. And they had the second, they had the second opportunity, because remember, Adam, when his wife ate of the forbidden fruit, then she handed him the whatever fruit that was, the fig, the apple, the grape, whatever it was. And he, he could have at that moment brought redemption for her, but instead, he partook of the fruit, and he, he brought death. So really, it was Adam's fault, ultimately. Israel was given the opportunity now, because remember, Israel is called collectively the son of God. They were now the firstborn son, whereas Adam had been the firstborn son. Now they're the firstborn son. So now they're given the opportunity to redeem the world, so to speak. But instead of doing that, they partake of the forbidden fruit. They partake of idolatry as well. What Adam did was idolatry. What they did is idolatry. So the second temple fell. And so twice there's a fall from grace. So the Midrash Rabbah continues and says, The Holy One, blessed be He, said to Israel, Okay? Before I read that, before I read that, so we see that the, the, the golden calf brought in death again. That's what we just said. Death came upon them once more, the second time. So when did that happen? Because it's important. According to Midrash Rabbah Tetzave 36.2, it says, We stumbled with regard to the golden calf at the sixth hour of the day. Keep that in your mind, the sixth hour of the day. Okay? Now, going back to Midrash Shabbat 32.1, Adam was angelic and was punished with death also. So it says, The Holy One, blessed be He, said to Israel, You have followed after the manner of Adam, the first man, who did not withstand his test for even three hours, for in the ninth hour, say ninth hour, the ninth hour, he was punished with eventual death. And I said, You are angelic, that is, you are immortal. But you follow the conduct of Adam, the first man. Consequently, surely, like Adam, you shall die. So we see here that death entered in at the golden calf. At what time? The sixth hour. And death entered in to judge all men with Adam at what time? The ninth hour. Okay, so the sixth hour and the ninth hour, we have the fall from grace. Two temples, right? First temple, second temple. They're all, uh, they're all destroyed, right? So, what was the consequence of this great sin? Midrash Rabbah Tetzave, 38.2, kind of going back and forth here. Midrash Rabbah Tetzave, 38.2. We're going to read about what is the consequence of Adam's sin. What is the consequence it says here in Midrash Rabbah 38.2? Alternatively, this is the matter. This is related to that which is written. You are, are you not from the beginning of time, O, o Adonai, my God, and my Holy One? We shall not die. O Adonai, you have ordained him judgment. O stronghold, you've established him to chasten us. Habakkuk 1.12. With this, the prophet, the prophet rather, is saying to God, Before Adam the first man arose and ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge, you were saying thus, that he should not eat from the tree, and as a result, he should not die. He should go on to live forever. As it is stated, are you not from the beginning of time, O Adonai, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. But 
since Adam defied your command, say defied. Defied, defied your command and ate, say ate. ate. Now this is to teach us something right here. Because as I said earlier, we like to figure out what's trivial to God and what's not. Right? And oftentimes we are our own judge as to what's trivial. So when you start talking, I always like to mention food, like the kosher laws. Because to most people, they, they think it's utterly absurd that God would care what we eat. That it makes no difference to him. And it's so trivial. Come on, I, we can understand that God is concerned about adultery. We can understand he's concerned about idolatry. We can understand he's concerned about murder. We can understand he's, he's concerned about um, not loving our neighbor. But re- does he really care what I have for breakfast? Really? Is that really on God's heart? And the answer, is, I'm going to begin with this. As a parent, do you care what your kids eat? Let me, let me rephrase that. As a good parent, do you care what your kids eat? Do you not help them select their menu? Or do you just show up and say, hey, honey, whatever you want. So when they're packing their lunchbox and they're putting in their cake and donuts and ice cream and all that kind of stuff, you're like, whatever. Yeah. Right? You're, that, you're okay with that? No, you're not. If you're a good parent. Now, if you're a bad parent, yeah, you, whatever, man. Right? So, so if, if good parents care about what their kids eat, then how much more does God care about what we eat? But even more than that, let's go back. And what brought death into the world? Food. God said, eat this, don't eat that. And we said, ah, we ate that. He said, okay, you got death. So what does that teach us? It teaches that God cares. Now, it goes on to say, as it says, are you not from the beginning of, 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 of the world, or, excuse me, Oh, I don't my God, my Holy One. But since Adam defied your commandment and ate from the tree, you brought death upon him in order to chasten people. So in the footnotes it says, as is it interpreted here, the verse states that during the period preceding Adam's sin, God asserted that as long as he remained, remained man's God and Holy One, by virtue of man abiding by his will, his commandments, not to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, man would not die. How do we make God God our God? How do we make him our Holy One? By obeying his will, his commandments. So guess what happens? If we jettison the commandments and we say they're not for today, we also jettison God. Because we've made ourselves our own God. Do what you want to do. That's why good parents don't let their children just eat whatever they want to eat because that, that's when they cease to become their parents. At that point, they become their landlords. They become their dealer. Right? Their warden. Whatever you want to call it, but they're no longer parents because parents teach and train. And parents have rules. Right? Come on. So it says here, Habakkuk spoke the verse in the first person because the decree that Adam would die affected all, say all, all, all his descendants. Are you descended from Adam? Yes. Yes. So, does, so death affects you and me. Death affects all his de- descendants, including Habakkuk. Okay. So we're learning here so far that Adam sinned, and as a result of his sin, everyone has been affected with death. That's called original sin. Which, to hammer the point, if you go on Google, uh, Rabbi Google, you'll, you'll learn that Jews don't believe in original sin, and that is just semantics. It's semantical because everyone has the opportunity when they're born to live a sin-free life. You do. And everybody can. Everybody can live by the commandments. You, you, everyone in this room, everyone in this room has the ability, or had the ability when they were a child, to not break any of the commandments. Now some of you, because of your theology, you're like, eh, what, what, we were told that nobody can keep, no, that's a lie. It is a lie from the pit of hell that people are not capable of keeping God's law. That is a lie. 
If that were true, God, heaven forbid, would not be a just judge. Because he's holding you accountable to something you're not capable of doing, and that is evil. Okay? So, everyone is capable, but why do we sin? Because we have a sin nature and we, we, we go after that nature. But even if everybody in this room kept all 613 commandments, and I know some of you have, <laughs> if, you, if you have, you're still going to die. And we talked about that, why that is. But the fact of the matter is, is that death affects everyone, and that's called original sin. Okay? And there's no getting, away, there's no getting around that. And even the sages admit that. So we, here we have Yeshua, I mean, excuse me, Adam, who sinned at, at the ninth hour, the golden calf was at the sixth hour. Now, God is not a God of coincidence, right? So what is the remedy? Let's turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And beginning reading in verse 45. Y'all with me so far? This is kind of deep stuff, but stay with me. Oh my goodness. From this, okay, listen to this. This is about the crucifixion of Mashiach. Okay? From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness covered all the land. Now, you think that's coincidental? That the golden calf sin occurred at the sixth hour, Adam's judgment of death that came, came into the world at the ninth hour, and at the crucifixion, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness covered the earth. And then Mashiach, it just so happens at the ninth hour, when judgment of death came into the world, at that very same hour, Mashiach cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some thought he was calling out to Elijah and so on. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge of wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it. Why did they do that? The reason they did that is because in Sanhedrin 43a... It says, when one is let out to be executed, he is given a goblet of wine containing a grain of frankincense in order to denumb his senses. For it is written, give strong drink unto him that is ready to be perish, and wine unto the bitter of soul. Proverbs 31.6. It was halakha if they thought somebody was suffering that they should give him a wine mixture. So they're following halakha here. The rest said, no, leave him alone. Let's see if... If Elijah comes to save him. And when Yeshua cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At the very moment that Yeshua gave up his spirit, it's at the very moment at which death entered the world, but through his death, life entered the world. And he was rectifying the sin of the golden calf and the sin of Adam in the garden. Now, consequently, in verse 50, 51, it goes on to talk about the, the temple curtain that was rent. And we, were, we told, uh, told you last week that that was a parochia. It was rent from top to bottom. It had nothing to do with now everybody can come into the Holy of Holies. No, no. It had nothing to do with that. Actually, if you read in the, in the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, 124.1, Simon 124.1, and if you also reference Midrash Rabbah Eka 1.1, you will find that it's customary on Tishba'av when we come into the, to the um, synagogue to mourn the temple, we remove the parochit. Why? We do that because the Midrash Rabbah and the Shulchan Aruch interpret the... Um, the verse uh, in Lamentations 2.17 to read, and he, Hashem, rent his holy garments. And his holy garment is the parochit. The reason is when God saw, this is what the rabbis teach, this is what's in the Shulchan Aruch, that when God saw the temple being destroyed, he rent his garments. And how does one rend his garments? He reaches up to the top of his garments and he pulls and rends. Where was the parochia torn? At the top. This is his garment. And when he saw his temple being destroyed, that's the spiritual temple of Mashiach, he rent his garments. 
Now, why is it also significant? Because in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Yeshua, who inaugurated a new and living way for us through the parochet that is his body. So, and, and Jake and Yochanan, two, three weeks ago, brought down that, that, that the parochet is, is the clothing of God. And if Mashiach, if the parochet is the body of Mashiach, and it says, when he saw Mashiach being crucified, he rent his garment. Right? Okay, so, got to keep going here. So the parochet is God's royal garment, and it is his his, the body of Mashiach. Now, as, a, as an aside, it was the third hour of the day that Mashi the scripture tells us, it was the third hour of the day when Mashiach was crucified. And by the way, in Sanhedrin 43a, it says, this is the Talmud, it says, on the eve of Passover, Yeshua the Nazarene was hanged and he was connected with the royal government of the line of David. So if anybody's wondering, you know, was Mashiach crucified on the Passover Eve, the 14th of Nisan? The answer is yes. And we get that testimony not from the internet, but we get it from the, the Talmud, 743a, and the rabbis say, yep, he was of the line of David and he was crucified on the 14th of Nisan. End of debate. Okay? All right. So no, people don't have to write like a 30,000 page article and distribute it on Facebook now. It's all out there. And I said it in a sentence. All right. <laughs> so it was a third hour of the day when Mashiach was crucified. And, it, and this is also the time on this day, the 14th of Nisan, the times of sacrifices were slightly different. The, the third hour of the day is when they would, we, they would normally offer up the morning Tamid lamb at the third hour. Okay? That is also the same time at which Adam was formed. So the third hour of the day, Adam is formed. The third hour of the day, the lamb, the morning lamb is offered. The third hour of the day, Yeshua is crucified. Okay? On this very day, because they were going to start slaughtering the Pesach lambs in the evening, they needed a lot of time because there's lots of lambs to slay. Every priest was called on duty. The, the whole, every priest was called on duty to the temple. And all of them, because you had to bring your lamb to the priest to be offered. And, so, and actually, here's the thing about, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm going to go over. Okay? Um, I've got to go over. I'm so sorry. But here's the deal. There was only one offering that you could sacrifice. And that was the Pesach offering. You could bring it to the priest, but the priest didn't have to sacrifice it for you. You could sacrifice it yourself. It was the only one. So anyway, they splashed the blood on the altar and all that. So that happened. So it says here, the sixth hour was a time on this day at which the evening Tommy lamb was offered. Sixth hour, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness covered the earth. So Adam is created on the third hour. The first lamb is offered at the third hour. Messiah is crucified at the third hour. Three hours later, at the sixth hour, the, the evening sacrifice is offered up on the altar, and that's when darkness covers the earth. So what happens at the ninth hour? Hmm, I don't know. Anything? Let's see. On this particular day, it was at the ninth hour when Mashiach gave up his spirit, when death had entered the world through Adam, but now life entered the world through Yeshua, the second Adam. It was at that very hour when they started to sacrifice the Pesach lambs. Nothing that God does is by coincidence. Everything has a timeline. And I remind you, we won't read it again, but if you, I remind you from last week, I mentioned Midrash Rabbat Teruma 35a, where Moshe is asking, if there's no longer a temple, how will you, because the temple served as collateral for Israel, if there's no temple and Israel still sins, what are you going to do? And God tells him, I will take one righteous man and he will serve as collateral for all Israel for all time. And that's Yeshua. What was another consequence? Midrash Rabbah Mishpatim 31a, excuse me. Let, me. let me turn here quickly. 
31, 32.1. I'm sorry, I said 31A. I meant 32.1. It says here, another explanation of like, of and like one of the princes, you shall fall. Rabbi Pincus, the Cohen son of Rabbi Chama said, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to them, you caused your own downfall. In the past, now this is talking about before the golden calf. In the past, you were served, say served. served. In the past, you were served through the divine spirit. But now, say now. now. But now that you have sinned by worshiping the golden calf, you will only be served through an angel, through an intermediary. So what they're saying here is that before you sinned with the golden calf, the divine spirit, God himself, was your servant. But after you sin, he sent an angel to serve you. You lost that divine connection. Okay? And so we read in the book of John, chapter 13, verse 33 through 5, Yeshua knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he gets up from the meal and lays aside his outer garment and taking a towel, he wrapped around it his waist then he pours water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel wrapped around him. What was he doing? Some saying, well, he was demonstrating what it means to be a servant. Okay. He was demonstrating to his disciples that they should not consider each one greater than the other. Okay. That's all nice and sweet and cute, but what was he really doing? He was restoring divine service. To his people. When you send the golden calf, I sent somebody else to wash your feet. I used to wash your feet when you were holy, but now that you have accepted me as your Mashiach, the divine spirit is back to, to be your servant again. And Kepha cries out, he says, not my feet. You're not going to wash my feet. You're not going to wash my hands, Mashiach. I don't deserve you to wash my hands and feet. And he says, if I don't wash your hands and feet, you have no part in me. And he says, and if you're going to wash my hands and feet, Mashiach, then wash my whole body. And he says, your whole body is already clean. Only your feet need to be washed. Why did he say that? Because according to Jewish halakha, as derived from the written Torah, there, as in, in this, this is brought out in, Mish, in the Mishnah and the religious perspectives by Jacob Nessner. There's a difference between the uncleanliness of the hands and the feet and the rest of the body. That once the body goes through the cleanliness of the red heifer, the body is clean and purified. But the hands and the feet we walk the earth and we work with our hands. And so even though our bodies are in the world, it, our bodies aren't of the world, yeah. but our hands and our feet are in the world, working the world. So he says, your body's been made clean already by me, but what you need to do is make sure you continually wash your hands and your feet with the water of the word. So he tells Kepha, I've already been your red heifer, Kepha. I've already made you holy. You are in the world, but you're not of the world. But if you don't continue to abide in my Torah and wash your hands and your feet, then you have no place in me. And when you come to me, I'll say, I never knew you. Amen. That's what Mashiach is saying. So when you've fallen twice, there's time to get up. And the time to get up is when Mashiach comes. This is why the song is so important. Even if he tarries, yet will I trust in him. Amen. And finally, I could talk more about how Yeshua is the light of the world. I do want to mention that the Torah portion begins by saying, which is equal to 9.13, which is also equal to the word breshit. The reason is, is because when they started to build the temple, the first thing God said was bring the light. And the first thing he said when he brought, built the world is bring the light. 
And by the way, Shabbat is 702, and light is 207, and infinite Ein Sof is 207. So God's light is equal to Shabbat, which is why we got to, if we want to be in the light, we got to be in Shabbat, which is why Yeshua also healed on the Shabbat. But I'm going to conclude with a final thought, because we're talking about Mashiach and his crucifixion and what he did for us. Midrash Rabbah Esther. It's appropriate, right? Midrash Rabbah Esther 10.4. We're, we're, we're okay. We're doing good. Baruch Hashem. By the way, Rabbi Trugman said, I wrote a quote here to remind myself. Rabbi Trugman said, Olive oil allegorically represents a profound secret. Light emanates from physical matter. Yeah. Midrash Rabbah is talking about the verse in the story of Esther where it says, Hurry, take the attire and the horse. So Haman took the garment and the horse. Where was he going to take it to? He's got to go honor Mordecai. <laughs> After receiving his orders from Ahasuerus, Haman went to find Mordecai. And when they told Mordecai that Haman was approaching, he became extremely frightened. Now Mordecai was sitting with his Talmudim, a symbol before him, and he says to his disciples, my children run and escape from here so that you are not to be burned by my coal. In other words, you won't be killed because of me. For, for the wicked Haman is coming to kill me. His disciples responded, if you die, we wish to die with you. So, th so th this, conclu this conclusion is, what will you be found doing when Haman comes looking for you? So they tell, them, they tell Mordecai, if you die, we're dying along with you. And so Mordecai told them, if so, let, it, let us begin praying. So that if we are to be killed, we will be killed while we are in the middle of prayer. Now a lot of people would say, that's what I want to be found doing. I want to be found praying when, when Haman comes looking for me. But that's not what the book of Revelation says. And it's not what the Midrash Shabbat says. The Midrash Shabbat says the dragon is coming after those who have faith in Yeshua and follow his Torah. They're washing their hands and feet daily. It doesn't say that they're praying. It doesn't say they have faith. Faith is important. I mean, come on. You wouldn't even begin if it weren't for faith, right? But faith is the front door. Who stands at the door of the house and just stands in the doorway? This is where I live. <laughs> In this doorway. That's, a lot, that's where a lot of people live. Yeah. And God is saying, oh, I'm so glad you like the door. Would you like to see the rest of the house? <laughs> and besides, you're blocking people. So come on. Yes, yes. <laughs> so it says, they concluded their prayers, but Haman did not yet arrive. So what they do? They then sat and began to study the laws of the Omer commandment. That's the first fruit. Mashiach was the Omer who was offered. He was resurrected on the 16th of Nisan. For that day was the 16th of Nisan. And, and some of y'all are watching out there and you're saying, but he wasn't in the tomb three days. Just go back about four lessons. Anyway, because that, that was the 16th of Nisan. So they began to study the Omer. We're going to study the Omer because Haman's coming. So what, now they're studying Torah. And when, the temple, and, and when the temple still stood, they would bring the Omer offering on that day. What day? The 16th of Nisan. Oh, my goodness. When did they bring the Omer offering? This is going to clear up so many Rabbi Google debates. When did they bring the, the Omer offering? The 16th of Nisan. That's what the Merosh Shabbat says. It's also what the Talmud says. It's also with what um, Josephus says. But who are they? Let's listen to Ralph online. When Haman came toward them, he asked them, what topic are you presently studying? They replied, we're studying the commandment to bring the Omer offering, as it is stated, when you bring a meal offering and the first grain to Hashem, etc., Leviticus 2.14. But there they sat. Mordecai was demonstrating for them the laws, the kemitzah, when Haman came, showing them how to, how to make the offering. So it says, he said to them, what did the Omer consist of? Was it of gold or silver? They replied to him, It was neither of gold nor silver, nor was it even comprised of wheat. Rather, it consisted of barley. 
Now we know that the, the Torah, I mean, excuse me, the uh, Besorah tells us that uh, Judas was overcome with the spirit of the enemy and he betrayed Mashiach for what? Silver coins, right? Betrayed him for silver coins. And the enemy thought he was prevailing over Mashiach because he got one of his Talmud to betray him with silver coins. All right? So it says, no, that's not silver or gold, Haman. It's all barley. It's the first fruit barley offering. He then inquired of them, well, what's the value of that? Was it of 10 kat? In other words, very expensive? They, had, they said to him, even a large omer was valued only at uh, only at 10 mane, a very, very mi minor amount. So here's Haman. He's thinking, okay, okay, it's not silver and gold, but surely it's got to be worth a lot of money. Like, no, actually, actually, the Omer that was offered was not beautiful that we should esteem him. In fact, he was, he was, he was the cornerstone that the builders rejected. He was the son that nobody thought would be king, so we didn't even call him from the field. In fact, we were hoping that he would be eaten by the bear or the lion. Turns out, Haman, that the one that we offered up was the one that we valued least, but God valued the greatest. Haman said he wasn't silver, he wasn't gold. And Haman cried out in exasperation. It says, the Midrash Shabbat says, Haman then said to them dejectedly, come forth for your ten mane of barley has triumphed over my 10,000 silver coins. Wow. The enemy thought that he was betraying Mashiach with silver and he would win the victory. Little did he know that that little grain of Omar would rise from the earth and completely trump his silver coins. This is what Purim is all about. It's what life is all about. It's what the word of God is all about. We failed in the garden and we failed at Mount Sinai, but we were victorious at Golgotha. Thank you, Hashem, for your mercy, your tender love towards us. Thank you, Hashem, for Mishiach Yeshua. And as we rejoice, let us never forget that Omer offering that nullified Haman for us. Amen. Amen.